franchise secrets, Eric Von Horn. Hey, in this episode of Franchise Secrets, I have my friend and business partner, Jeff Huron. We, uh, we talk about some of the big aha moments that we've, uh, that we've had in life. And that just kind of came up randomly, but it really kind of shaped us and kind of went down this rabbit hole of the challenges and uh, adversity that we've, that we face and work ethic and how that translated into uh, helping us become who we are today and really be in business like we are. Now, Jeff and I used to be in competing tax businesses. We both got our start in the tax business and we used to compete against each other. And we didn't know each other at the time, but we definitely knew each other's brands. Um, and then we came, became friends, became business partners. Um, but uh, we all, we got into the tax business and why that was such a hard business. And we talk about that, but that's also kind of like what helped make us successful in, uh, in other ventures that we've gone on to do after the tax business. So, We also talked a little bit about Front Street, uh, some of the things that we're doing from an advisory standpoint, why we advise the way that we do, how we think about advisories, how franchisees and franchisors should be thinking about advisory. Board of advisors is very different than a board of directors and why you want advisors on your team because they are going to help make you better. So I hope you enjoy the show. All right, Jeff, you're becoming a regular on the show thought uh today it's a uh, thursday i think it's thursday we got a trip coming up uh next week to go to an undisclosed city to talk to undisclosed brands three of them in one city um i thought it'd be interesting just to have some conversation on like what we're doing at front street just you know day to day just launched two brands and i think uh, merging brands and franchisees that are part of emerging brands or looking at buying emerging brands uh, will get a lot out of this, some nuggets. And as you and I were talking before we hit record, we want people to get nuggets out of this podcast. So when you listen to a podcast, what do you, what do you look for? Like, why do, you, why do you listen to podcasts or watch podcasts and, and what do you try to get out of it? Well, if I find somebody that like, I, I just kind of like the flow of how it works. That's helpful. Uh, the content has to be good. Otherwise I kind of, I have a very short attention span, as you well know, probably off the charts on the ADD scale <laughs> of things. Uh, so it's got to, the content has to be interesting to me, delivery. But at the end of the day, like what I want to walk away from is, you know, I've used this kind of like phrase before, but like light bulb moments. I've had those in my life. Like you get, it's like, aha, whether I came up with them on my own or I listened to somebody on a podcast, I don't really read, but I do audiobooks all the time. So something where it's like, oh yeah, I get it to the point where I can take that and apply it to my life, whether it's my personal life, my business life whatever, whatever, whatever portion of my life that I can apply that to. Like that's, that's what I think of like with nuggets. I like nuggets. I love nuggets. And I like, I like to write, I usually like to write stuff down, but that's kind of what I'm looking for. Like, is there something that I can grab? If it's, a, if it's 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour or whatever it is, is there something that I can take from that? It's a light bulb moment in my life where I'm like, Ooh, yeah, I can plug that in here. Like that's, that's what I like to take from stuff like this. My first light bulb moment was uh, that I realized was when I was, so I kind of got started in franchising, but I was mowing a lawn, planting some flowers for a lady, ended up walking away with a with the ability to buy her house, even though I didn't have the money. And I realized I just had to find the deal. And if you have the right nice. deal, the, you can find the money. Like who wouldn't want to, uh, invest into an, an amazing deal. You just have to find the deal. The money is easy. And, sure. and I did, I, I ran into the deal and I'm like, wow, I just need to, you know, find these deals and the money will come. And that's happened over and over. And then all of a sudden, you know, it flipped. I became the money to a lot of the deals. And, and it right. really makes sense when you the money. Like you see these young hustlers out there and, and, uh, just bring these deals to me and I'm in. So, 
See, that was in my in my early 20s. And I used that as my seed money to get into Liberty Tax, where you and I became fierce competitors in the tax business. Really yeah, early. man. What about you? What, what are right. what's some big light bulb moments that you've had? Man, you're putting me on the spot. Well, see, now you're trying to take me back to like something that. No, we have, we're talking moment. little light bulb, little nuggets, light bulb, like, aha. Uh-huh. And I like how you phrase it. Like you can, you can um, l- hear something and apply it to different areas of your life. You can hear something when you're talk- when you're thinking about something personal, apply it to your family, but then also you can apply it to business. And, and I, like, I like getting nuggets that you can apply in different places. But when you said light bulb moment, I thought like, that's one of the big, big things that was a light bulb moment for me, but it really changed the direction. So you have to one up, you have to one up me. You can, I know you can. It's not hard for you to one up me. I mean, going back, something that I had and something that I say very often today, and it really goes way, way back. So when I, when I was growing up, I grew up in Northern Michigan. My sports were, once I got, once I kind of narrowed it down, it was tennis and hockey. And I played uh, very competitively in both, but tennis was kind of like a year round thing. And I had this awesome coach and in the summertime, he had one of these like Jeep Wranglers with like the top down and all that stuff. I thought he was so cool. I was like 12 years old, but this guy would pick me up at 6 a.m. in the morning at my house and I'd be like 12. I'm like, gosh, it's supposed to be my summer. You know, you go to school all year. It's like summer's supposed to be fun. But uh, this guy was just, this guy was really an amazing coach. And he picked me up and he had these 55 gallon drums. He had like eight of them in a Jeep Wrangler. And it full that's not even physically possible, but keep going. Dude, I'm telling you, these things were <laughs> stacked on top of each other. He would fill them up like, 80%. So some of them would have like, he'd be like, you need to hold on to these two. Like it was crazy. And we had to hit through them like three times, but he kept on saying the same thing over and over and over again. And it was work hard, study hard, be coachable, work hard, study hard, be coachable. And of all the coaches I've had for any sport or even like business coaches, like that's, that's something, that's a nugget that like, I'm, I'm going to turn 50, dude. August 23rd, the big five zero, And so you're talking like 38 years ago, like that is that, that, that saying, like I've carried that through. It's a big part of my work ethic. It's a big part of like the attention that I put with, on my kids and my family. Like I put a lot of work into the relationships that I have across you know, all relationships, but certainly at home. But in the back of my head, it's that work hard, study hard, be coachable, work hard, study hard, be coachable. So that's in my mindset. That's what I'm trying to translate to my kids as they grow. Um, And then in my business world, like it's the same thing. Like, even though I feel like I'm, I'm like very, very experienced at, at what I do and what we're doing together, like you can't, you can't ever stop sharpening that ax. You can't, you can't ever stop being coachable either. Like, even though now I'm more of a coach, like I still need to be coachable myself and I still have to study hard. Like the world is evolving, right? Like it's, it's the business world. The business world constantly is changing. The franchise world is changing. Things within the franchise world are changing. And something that, you know, maybe you were the best in the world at a year ago, if you're not constantly working hard and studying hard to, to, to always continue to evolve and stay ahead of the game, um, then it fades away. So like that, that's a nugget that I got when I was 12, it was ingrained in my head and, and it's definitely one of the biggest light bulb moments that, that, that has clicked with me. I love and it. I, I, and I talk about work hard, study hard, be coachable with brands that we work with, with franchisees, like just every part of my life. So did I one up you? Did I yeah, one up you? Did. I, I have, I, uh, <laughs> I had to study hard because I was a C student. So I had to study hard. 
I didn't really study that hard. So I didn't, I, I, um, I didn't really, I studied once I was in college and studying the things that I really enjoyed. I enjoyed that. And then after college in business, I became a student of business. And I, and I studied that more than, more than I ever studied in, in high school and, and in college. For sure. Work ethic. I got that growing up here in South Dakota, working construction from, a, you know, like a little kid through, uh, through college. So, and that's why I did not want to, uh, have work with my hands and my body, uh, yeah. you know, cause I just saw how, how difficult that was. I didn't want to do that, but hard work was just that, that, that came natural. Um, and being coachable, I, that's, I'm naturally coachable. Um, and I don't know why, but I'm just naturally coachable. I'm always wanting to learn and learn from other people. And I notice, I notice that when, when other people are not coachable. And I know that's one of the things that you and I look for in founders that want to work with us at Front Street Equity. By the way, Front Street Equity, basically, if you had to sum up what we are, it's myself and Jeff and we got two other business partners, Jim Jaggers and Bobby Brennan. And we help emerging brands build enterprise value in a compressed time frame. That's at the that's yeah. really what Front Street's about. Part private equity, part um franchise sales organization, part strategic advisory and other things. But when we're talking to brands, like we want that founder to be coachable. Let's talk about founders, founders and brands. Like what mm-hmm. do you look for? What do you, I mean, you and I have seen so many different brands come and go. Dude. <laughs> and we talked to them today. I mean, yeah, we talked to brands today where I they are just, I mean, I talked to a brand, I told you about them yesterday. Five franchisees been doing it for five years and they're burned out and they just want they just want to exit. We we're not interested in talking to brands like that because we want founders that are hungry to grow. You know, that's so value. funny, man. Like, I mean, we talk to a lot of brands, at least one or two of them on a monthly basis. Like, they're looking for an exit strategy. They're like, I, I'm blown out. I'm burned out. Like, do you, do you know anybody that'll buy this? Like, okay, that that's not what we do. Now, listen, like exiting you out of the business when we 10, 100,000 X this thing? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do that. But like on the front end, on the first very on the on the very first conversation, it's almost bizarre where they're like, I just don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> it's like, well, how are you gonna inspire others to do it then? So yeah, that's really so interesting. So that's a big no for us, whatever. And and you know, we'll take calls yeah. on all brands and there are places I you know, I referred them to two other two other groups that are that would probably be the right fit for them. Um, but when we look at founders, what are some of the things that we are attracted to in founders? We got two amazing founders. Uh, oh man, they are, they're, they're amazing founders, uh, both female awesome. founders of two great brands. Um, but like what attracted you to these founders? So, uh, pain, pain is so important. Pain's so important. I mean, look, I, I, I've said this on these podcasts before. The first rule of franchising is don't franchise your business. The second, the second thing to know, and maybe it's the second rule, is to go from an emerging brand to an established brand. And let's just say that that's a magical number of a hundred franchisees. It's just a death march, man. It is. We absolutely don't sugarcoat it when we talk to people like. This is, there's no pie in the sky here. Okay. This is going to be the most horrific grind for the next couple of years. Right. I've heard and you so, say that. I've heard you it's, say that it's, to it's the true, founder. Like, guys, man. What, I, what Jeff is saying right now are conversations that we have with the founders that we're involved with, or maybe it scares away some founders that are thinking about getting involved, but these are true it, conversations. It has. That we have. It has. It has. And, but good, good. I'm I'm glad that it has because so if you're if we're honest with them and talk about you know the first rule is don't franchise your business and if you decide to do then let's get real about how difficult this is going to be. We have to see some data points that they've gone through this some type of pain 
in getting to where they are today with their franchise business before it was a franchise business with their corporate units, you know, if you, whatever you want to call it, like when they started the business, like grit, grind, pain, because you're, you're about, you know, you're, you're telling them, Hey, it's going to be painful. If they don't have a reference point about how they overcame pain and we can't have that data point, then it's not going to work. And so like, I would, you know, that's ground zero for me is we, we, I, when somebody has gone through that pain and gotten through that pain with grit and grind and resolve, um, it's also humbled them. I mean, I've grit, I mean, I've gone through grit and grind, man. I know you have gone through grit and grind and it makes you stronger a lot stronger. It gives you a reference point for the next time you go through it. Um, and I think that that's, that's, that's number one is where's, you know, ta- let's talk about the pain. Like, let's talk about like, let's talk about everything that you've gone through to get to where you are. <clears throat> and part of that also is how they're conveying that, right? Like, they got to be a good storyteller. Steve Jobs was a good storyteller, right? Um, Walton from Walmart, great storyteller. Like the best, the builders, the builder, the great build, the greatest builders of all time have to have gone through the pain and the grit and the grind, but they have to be able to tell that story in an inspiring way, right? Uh, and so. It's super exciting when, when we can meet with somebody that's just real and raw and can talk about the pain, the ups and downs. You know, sometimes we get on these calls, Eric, and they just, they just sugarcoat everything, right? <laughs> what makes you different? <laughs> oh, we're so much, our, it's, our service is so much better. It's just better. And like, it's, you're like, okay, how is it better? Well, it, it's just, it's just better. Customers say it's better. So it's like they, they, it's so awesome to see somebody really break down and be real about the experience that they've, they've gone through to get to where they are today. And that, that they tell it in a really passionate and meaningful way, conversationally. You know, sometimes they even get emotional. That's when I'm like, okay, this is worth even more than a second call. Like this is, this is what we're really looking for here. Because the reality is, is that when you're, when you're building a business, there's going to be giant ups and downs and that's, and that's a good thing. And every, every time you get down and build it back up, like you just become so much stronger. So like, that's, that's what, before we even get into the business or the unit economics or how do you get customers, like before you get into it any of that stuff. Like, you know what it's really about, man? It's about relationships, right? Like if, if we're going to anchor in and they're going to anchor in, we're going to anchor in together to go build something. Like you have to, you have to want to like, you want to actually want to be around these people. Right. And, and I personally can't work. And I have worked with some founders in the past that after a while, I was just like, oh man, I misread this one. I should have dug deeper into that pain and the grit and the grind because it's just the relationship wasn't there. So now I'm way more relationship focused. Can I identify with this founder, the pain and the grit and the grind that, that I've gone through? Can, can, can I, can that, am I feeling what they're telling me and can I, can I connect with that? Cause that's, that's where it's at. I mean, look, when you're building something and yeah, you nailed it. Like our mission at front street is to exponentially grow enterprise value in a compressed time frame. That's very aspirational. What's in between what the fine print is underneath that is this ain't going to be easy, man. This is not going to be easy. So can I be in trench warfare with this person? Or if I'm in the trenches with these people, is it going to drive me insane? Or, and am I going to drive them insane? I mean, I'm not saying it's one way, 
So that's what I'm learning. What about you, man? What like when you, when we're on these calls and we're meeting people, like what do you think? Well, let me uh, hit on that adversity. I was listening to a podcast with Alex Hermosi, not the one that I sent you. It was it was a different one where he's basically saying the the person interviewing him says, "Tell me your story." So he told the story in a compressed time frame. It took him about two minutes to tell his his story. Then he said, "There's a lot more that happened in there that was painful." And then the the host said, "Well, tell me more about that." And so he spent about five minutes going into some of the like. This thing, uh, par- my partner, you know, basically bankrupted me. I didn't have, uh, my backup was against the wall. I didn't have any money. Yeah. And, and then, and then this happened and then that happened a second time. And then this is how I doubled down and this is how I won. And then he, then he had a couple more and he's like, even within all of that, I just gave you the tip of the iceberg on the adversity that I faced. And it just made me think like, this is the entrepreneurial life. Like you, it, everything is just not you know, you buy a business, you buy a franchise and everything is great and it's easy. Sometimes that happens. And I've had that happen with some, some of the things that I've purchased and, and, and then others were just very difficult. Um, I think about some brands like, you know, I think there's two brands that stick out as pretty solid brands, really good unit economics and the franchisees at, for the most part did really well. And that's Orange Siri and Crumble Cookies. Like it was hard not to screw those two things up. And now, now there's, you know, I know it, both of those brands are probably facing a decline in different ways at different times. It's probably just part of the economic cycle and, and, um, and competition and things like that. But you and I were in the tax business. The tax business is not easy. And I used to be <laughs> jealous of, franchisees and like, why didn't I buy an anytime fitness when, when, when yeah. the tax, you know, you and I got into the tax business, we could have bought an anytime fitness and those things did pretty well. Um, considering what they're not, it wasn't as hard as a, as the tax business. And then looking back on that, I was really grateful for what I learned in, in that hard business. And, and I've looked back and I have a lot of friends that are franchisors large franchisees, private equity backed franchisees are doing really big things on the vendor side in the franchising world all came from the Mm -hmm. tax business with me. And I was talking to the former CFO of that business and he's just like, Eric, and I was texting him the other day and, and he's like, Eric, it's amazing how many great people came out of that system, but it was cause it was hard and, and we, and we learned and we grew. It was so hard. It was so hard, you know, like, and I, and I, I'm glad that I cut my teeth on that, but damn, was that hard. So we were both area developers for competing brand. And, you know, for people that are on here that know a little bit about franchising and how it works around like the, um, like the FDD, which was called something else back then. But so in the tax business, tax business ends April 15th, right? So then they have to get their audited financials then. So most people that are listening to this call that are in the, on the franchise or side, at least you're going through a renewal period, like January through end of April, like most people, cause your fiscal year ends on December 31st. I mean, that's probably 90% of franchisors or 80 or something. In the tax business, you had different fiscal year because you, you gotta wait till tax season is over. Then you have to go into it. So you're kind of dark until June 1st, right? Well, with the, with the franchisor that we had our area development deal with, they cut off any franchise sales on October 31st because we had to get them open by January mm-hmm. 2nd, right? And, um, and even that would be pretty tough. So it's kind of like your window of opportunity, you know, as, as area developers, we were sub franchising is kind of a way to, to kind of describe it. It's how easy way to be kind of like a franchise. You get to learn to be a little bit of a franchise or without yeah. the risk and yeah. yeah and but you, you get you get a feel for it. Attention, franchisors and franchisees. There are two really important resources that I want to share with you that will help you avoid costly mistakes and increase your enterprise value. 
The first is our free Facebook group. It's a community that has over 4,000 franchisees and franchisors in it. When somebody asks a question, they get honest and authentic answers from multiple perspectives. You can join the group for free over at franchisesecrets.com forward slash Facebook. The second resource I want to share with you is if you're a franchisee and you want to be around a community of successful Z's and other brands and in other industries, this is why I created the Franchisee Mastermind. If you want access to the best single and multi-unit owners to know what they're doing, or if you want to be around other multi-brand owners, then you'll want to check out my Franchisee Mastermind. The reason why people join is they want access to my Rolodex, my connections, to each other, they want to shortcut success, both short-term and long-term. Links will be in the show notes or at scalablefranchise.com. Yeah. So you can't, in between the end of tax season and June 1st, you can't talk to a single person. You're what's called dark. So we would go June 1st, boom. And we, we were done October 31st. So June, July, August, September, October. You got five months, right? Well, for the three years that we were area developers, we opened the 300 plus stores per year, a thousand in three years. And so not only do you have to onboard, not only do you have to walk three people through like the franchise development process, but as, as people start coming on board, we also were responsible for uh, connecting them with the local real estate broker, connecting them with a the contractor, helping them onboard and train new staff for the first year. So all the first year folks, you know, once you train somebody once on how to do that, they can kind of do a lot of that afterwards. But, you know, each year we were onboarding probably 200 franchisees and opening 350 locations. And so you have to do all that work from like June 1st to the end of the year. I mean, talk about a grind. If I'm, if I'm, McDonald's and I'm going to open a hundred stores this year, a thousand stores. You divide that number by 12, right? A thousand stores is 83 a month. hundred stores is eight a month, right? In the tax business, every single new store has to open on the same day, January 2nd. So right. yeah, if you got, if you're opening 350 stores this year, all 350 are opening on June, on January 2nd, like the amount of pressure and we were in, you know, my, myself and my partners, we were in multiple states. Back then I was telling my wife, like, I would buy a one-way plane ticket to Tampa. She's like, when are you coming home? I'm like, I don't know. And I'd go from Tampa to <laughs> Orlando to Miami, then go up to Chicago, then go to Detroit. I'd just be gone for like three weeks, man. And then I'd come back for like two days. Now... That being said, once the deal that we had with our franchisor was once the store is open, they did 90% of the support. We only had to do 10%. So from January to, you know, Jan January was very busy for us, but like, you know, from mid February for the next couple of months, you got some downtime, but man, grit and grind. And, and I will, that's where I got my work ethic from, mm -hmm. it's especially when it came to franchising is just the pain that we went through during that period of time was, was insane. I mean, we were, we were really working seven days a week. I'm not, not, there was seven, it was seven days a week. And For sure some days on a Sunday, a Sunday would be six, six or seven hours. But like Monday through Friday was 18. Saturdays was 12. And you're doing that five, six months a year. I mean, so yes, so as I rotated out of that and got into other things, like as we started building other brands, that's that was good insight that I could bring. And and yeah, when we talk about like talking to a brand about like like literally the pain that it has to go through, like you you have to be able to look at them too and see how do they take that information. Do they take that information as, yeah, I'm sure it's going to be hard. They take that information as, let me tell you about like my grit and grind, which is kind of, that's kind of what I want to hear. We want to get one up. And we want to, we want to see. Yeah, let's get we one up. We want to get one Dude, up I'm, on, I'm, on the grit I'm, and the grind story. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, yeah. you know, I, I love it when, when they, well, one, it's, it's, it's humbling when you talk about failures or yeah. challenges or things like that. And I had a friend that, um, 
lost a bunch of money in a hotel deal that he did. And then he was trying to get another partner in another business and, and he did. And this wealthy individual, this part, the guy that ended up kind of partnering with him on some stuff said, I'm doing this because you took a lump on the hotel business. Like, you know what it's like to lose and you've been there and you yeah. survived. So, um, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot to be said for that. And I think that should be encouraging to people that are listening. If, you know, just cause you're, you're number one into your franchise as a franchisee or a franchise or two years into it or three years into it, um, you know, you're still, you know, maybe in the first quarter of the game and, you know, you don't know what, what lies ahead and, and like embrace right. these lessons and get better. And it might not be the brand that you're in today. You'll learn things in the brand that you're in today for the brand that you'll be in tomorrow that, um, that you're going, you would choose a different brand because of the things that you're learning, the things that you're going through. So the worst thing that can happen, I guess, for the true entrepreneur, the person out there that, that want, or the person that wants to be self-employed is just to quit and go back and find a job and start, start working a normal job because I couldn't imagine right. going back to that. But if you learn, no. it's still going to take risks, um, you know, this should be encouraging so, to you. I, yes. I mean, I think about, I love when, I love when people are like, okay, so what, what is front street? I love, I love, like, that's my new thing. That's my new thing. Like, well, I don't, for, well, I don't. One thing is we're not super clear. You even go to the website. It is not a crystal clear website and that's on, you know, by design. Well, let's zero in on it. Let's zero in on it. Yeah. So like, so you and I and our other partners, we've, we've been a part of, I mean, collectively, good Lord, 50, 60 plus brands, 10,000 plus units collectively. Right. But like also just all the different facets of franchising that we've touched. We most, all of us have been franchisees. Most of us have been even franchisors, uh, franchise development, sales, um, area developers, area representatives. I mean, you name it, right? So, so when we, when we, we think about if the mission is, Hey, let's exponentially grow enterprise value and press time frame. That's the mission, right? That should be How the mission, by the way, of franchisors and franchisees. Like you want yeah. to build. Well, that's alignment, right? We're looking for brands that are aligned with that mission because yeah, yeah that should, that should be the mission. Right. Like if you all, if you're the only owner of a company and you own a hundred percent of the business, well, you're the only, you're the only person with the stock. Like you should want to grow the value of that stock. If you have investors, I promise you, like their mission is going to be, let's grow the value of this stock and let's do it in a compressed time frame. but let's, let's bubble wrap it in mitigation, right? Let's not create a bunch of headache. Um, but I think that, you know, where, where Front Street was born. And by was, the way, mitigate, you mitigate through experience. You mitigate through having people that know the landmines that are in front of you that you don't even know where they are. They've been there. They've done that. They've experienced it. They've taken the lumps. They've seen the successes. That's how you bubble wrap and mitigate. That's right. That's right. So if I'm somebody that is not a franchisor, but I'm thinking about franchising my business, or I am somebody that is, is currently uh, a, a new franchisor, got a couple franchisees and I want to scale, or I've been a franchisor for 10 years, I got 50 franchisees, but I want to get to a couple hundred, like wh whatever it is, like, it's like, what, what's it going to take? You know, it's going to be painful. So what can you do to mitigate the pain? Right? So at, at front street, we felt like there's just kind of a, there's, there's more needs that, that any type of these brands that like the non-franchise company that wants to franchise the emerging franchise, the, the, you know, somebody that's been doing it for a while that wants to scale, like there's needs in the marketplace that, that, that there's not an outlet for, right? Not under one roof. Right. There's franchise sales organizations and yes, they offer additional things, but 
make no bones about it. They offer additional things because they're trying to protect the sales process. And I know this very well because I built the, the largest franchise development organization still with the record today of amount of units. Like, so I, I know that side, I know where they come from. And yes, like they absolutely care about the franchisees. They care about the brands. They want everybody to be successful, but I don't know if there's total alignment. So how do you get to total alignment? So like, if you could, I, I want to grow my brand exponentially. I want to grow the, the value of the stock or what we call enterprise value exponentially. And I want to do it in a shorter period of time. So, so what do you need for that? That's kind of where we started with front screen. It's like, what's the, what's, what's all the needs, right? Well, it, the, the first one, and it's kind of the, the, I, we, we have five pillars, right? We have four today, but we're adding a fifth. First pillar, and it, it's really from cradle to exit is strategic advisory, right? So what, what does that even mean, right? So if I have a, a business that I want to grow, right, and I'm probably good at some things and I'm not good at other things and whatever I'm not great at, I hopefully have some, some, you know, people that work inside the brand, inside the business, you know, leadership team that if I'm a marketing guy, I've got a gal or a guy that is, that is really good at ops, right? The yin and the yang. But wouldn't it be great? to have world-class advisors, like a world-class advisory board that is aligned with the mission that is part of the growth strategy. So not only do I have the yin and the yang inside, but I got the yin and the yang outside that is really experienced, right? At, at helping me fulfill my mission in an aligned way. So that's pillar number one is strategic advisory. Our brands have like level 10 ninja advisors, strategy, vision, marketing, content creation, franchise development, operations, finance, real estate construction, like a full-fledged advisory board of ninja. Like, does that increase or decrease the probability of success? We would say it increases it. And, and I'll go on a little tangent here. And before you go to pillar number two, I was, um, I was on, on a, a board of advisors call, um, unrelated to front street, um, in a, um, in a brand. And I was, you know, basically a fly on the wall there. And they had one of the largest, you know, family of, uh, QSRs, the, the guy that has a family of QSR franchisors, quick service restaurants in the food business. And he started asking questions. Um, in, in, in this meeting and I sent another advisor a text message. I'm like, holy cow, this guy knows his stuff. And, and this other guy who's well respected mm -hmm. in the franchising world is like, oh yeah, he's, he's freaking amazing. Like he will dive into it and he will. So he was asking really hard questions, pointed questions that would make a founder nervous and squirm. And, and yet at the end of that meeting, um, they, he said, Hey, let, let's get together on this because I have some ideas here. I have some introductions there. Let's, um, let's roll out something a little bit different this way because you don't want to be exactly like your competitor. And this is how you can be different based on how you're doing things. And anyway, he just went into things. He kind of, um, asked the really hard questions and had, had answers after listening that were brilliant that the founder, or someone that didn't have experience in that particular in, in franchising like he did, that founder would never have been able to do that with that brand on their own. And that's the power of strategic advisory. And this, this particular founder, you know, wanted to bring in that type of, of advisory. You pay dearly for it because, you know, somebody with that kind yeah. of experience, like you, me, Jeff, Jim, Bobby, you know, what we have, like you can't pay us to come in and consult. Like, no, brands can't afford that. But what they can do is, is, you know, work with us at Front Street if it's the right, you know, if it's the right uh, thing for both both sides. That's how you get that. And it might not be Front Street. It might be somebody else. But I think Whoever, takeaway yeah. and strategic advisory is merging brands or brands that aren't where they're where they want to be, where they thought they would be. It's time to seek out mentors and it's time to 
uh, uh, like Jeff was saying, uh, be humble and learn and be yeah. teachable, be coachable and, and, and go into some of these meetings and spend, you know, pick out a dozen people that are where you want to be and have them take a look at your business, pay them $500, a thousand dollars an hour and, and learn from them because they're going to be able to give you those nuggets that Jeff and I were talking about early, early in this conversation. They'll be able to give you those nuggets that, um, yeah. that will really change the course of, of your brand. So strategic advisory is, uh, is worth so much, so much. Yeah. Just if you're listening to this, like Google, like board of advisor, like why wouldn't you want a world-class board of advisors? And just a distinction point, like we're not talking board of directors here. This isn't like, these aren't stockholders. They're stakeholders in an aligned way, but they're not stockholders. This isn't a board of directors. This is like, I have, I have a, a, a strategic plan that I want to execute. I would like to, I would like to, to, to convene my board of advisors. I got a real problem today. I'd like to convene my board of advisors. Like, why wouldn't you want a world class board of advisors if you want to if you want to grow your business? So that's, that's pillar strategic one. advisory. Yep, pillar one. Pillar two is yes. If you want to grow, without a doubt, franchise development and sales is a pillar, right? And uh, and so we have a we have a separate company within our underneath our umbrella, separate from strategic advisory, that is providing, we, we call it tens, but a dream team, right? And, and here's the differentiator with this pillar than what's else in the market today is there are some great FSOs. These are our friends, by the way, we're not here to, <laughs> they are we're not here sure. to bash FSOs. <laughs> like FSOs are great. Okay. Like, by the way, we, can't, we can't do a million brands like them anyway. So like do an FSO, <laughs> but like, here's the distinction here, when we say dream team, here's the distinction, right? So. You know, NBA basketball, most people know a guy named Michael Jordan, right? You know who Michael Jordan is? I've heard Air. of him. I've heard of him. He's 23, 23. Air Jordan. That Air Jordan <laughs> movie is great. Um, I had some Air Jordans anyways, back in the so, 90s. There you go. So they they had a team that I think won like 72 games. I think they won like 72 and 10. And they still... Today, I think that that's like the record winning percentage for an NBA season, right? And they had Jordan and they had Poopin, two Hall of Famers, right? And Michael Jordan is probably the best player to ever play, right? Then they also had Dennis Rodman, right? I've got, Tony I've, uh, I almost got a basket on Dennis Rodman. I played him uh, one on one and um, no way. It, it was just a little intimidating. I, I just, I backed up and just did like a Hail Mary and it's on video. It's very embarrassing. Um, it didn't go in. Did it hit the rim? Um, I'm going to say it did hit the rim. I can't remember, but he was just, and he wasn't even trying. I, I, I just couldn't even, I just couldn't. He was probably hung over, dude. He probably went to bed like an hour before. <laughs> we talked about, we talked about his trip to North Korea. We had, we had a conversation. Oh, oh this that. is kind of recent. This was a, this was a couple of years ago. Oh, and, um, and I said, and I said, I can't talk about this on the podcast. I said, tell me one of the craziest stories you have. And um, that's definitely not going to go on the podcast because he, as you can imagine, Probably has some pretty not. crazy stories. Probably not. So anyways, like, look, that team was good. So you get Dennis Rodman, Tony, Ku Tony Kukoc. Uh, and th th the bottom line was, is they won 72 games, man. That's still like a record, right? Not only was that the best team that year, they're recognized as the best team ever because of the record. Like, there's a data point around it, right? So that's kind of how I think about, like, there are some awesome franchise sales organizations around franchise development that they have, like, they got teams like that. I'm not kidding. They really do. They got teams like that. Now, you know the Jordans, you know the Pippins, you start, you know the Rodmans, and then I, I get down to, like, Bill Wellington, you're like, Who's that dude? I don't, know. I don't even know who that guy was. So like, look, it's like an NFL team. If I win the Super Bowl, I probably got, there's 22 starters, 11 on offense, 11 on defense. I probably got a world-class quarterback. Probably got, I probably got like 
five or six like all pros, maybe four, five, six all pros. But then I got some guys that are like right there. And there's some guys that are like nobody's ever going to remember these people, but they, you're still the best team. You won the Super Bowl, right? The way that we think at Front Street around franchise development is different, right? We don't want to carry a team of 50 people around franchise development. It doesn't make any sense, right? Because we think that each brand is wet clay. It's a blank canvas and it needs to be curated perfectly, right? So rather than saying, hey, we got 50 people that do franchise development, let's go curate a dream team. Let's go put together a dream team. So let's go back to the Bulls, right? 72 and 10, Jordan, Pippen, two, two Hall of Famers on that team and a lot of All-Stars, right? Well, in 1992... Uh, the United States of America decided to put together a real dream team for the Olympics. 1992 Olympics, okay? So guess what? Michael Jordan was on that team, right? And Scottie Pippen was on that team because they're two Hall of Fame. Dennis Rodman was not on that team. Neither was Steve Kerr or Kuko or anybody else other than those two. So who else? There was 12 guys on that dream team that I didn't coin that. That's what they coined. That was the name. It's the dream team, right? The only not, the only non hall of famer on that team was Christian Leitner, but that was because he had just come off becoming, he was the greatest college basketball player of all time. The United States built a dream team of 11 hall of famers plus Christian Leitner, right? Two of which were on the best basketball team team of all time in Pippen and Jordan. So where are we going with this? Where I'm going with this is is like that's how how Front Street thinks about franchise development and sales is rather than saying we got this big team, come work with our team. No, 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 no. We've got some we 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 want to build a dream team around your brand, right? Because the reality is, Eric is if the dream team of 92 played the that Chicago Bulls team that won 72 games that year, the dream team wins by 40 points. 40 points. Not even close. Because it's 11 Hall of Famers versus two Hall of Famers. It's all about possibilities and probabilities in that world. So that's how we differ and that's how we think about it. Because if we're aligned with a brand to exponentially grow enterprise value in a compressed time frame, I don't want the best team. I want the dream team, right? Curated and customized for my objective. That's pillar number two. So one of the one of the ways. So you just new brands have a li- with a limited budget because not all brands have a limited budget. You know, some of them might have a bunch of money that they could uh, throw at uh, a lot of a lot of staff or throw at whatever. Typically that is not necessarily the best thing for a brand because they're going to be, you know, spending too much money on a lot of this stuff. Um, but so how do we look at that, Jeff? Like, you know, one of the things it's that all we vari- do- It's gotta be variable, man. When we look like, look, it's gotta be, everything's gotta be variable. Like I, I've never been in the retainer game, not, not ever. Um, I've done some minimal, minimal, minimal work per hour kind of thing, but that was, that was like the beginning of COVID. Um, if you're, it, everything about everything in, in a relationship, right? We talked about relationships, whether it's business or personal, it's about alignment, right? I've been with my wife since 1997. We didn't make it this far if we weren't aligned on a lot of things. Now, trust me, we, <laughs> We, we, can, we can argue and all that stuff, but we're aligned on our future vision and always have been. And that's what's really key. Same thing in business. When we partner with a founder to go build a business, we have to have, we have to have alignment, right? So people that I think do it right are the people that say, hey, it's got to be, it's got to, all compensation has to be aligned with productivity. No productivity, no compensation. So yep. that's that's kind of how I'd answer that one. So let's get into pillar number three. Hey, we don't have oh, time for pillar number three. We're going to get into that at a at a at a later oh, date. I that's want, a TBD. That's it. 
TBD. I want to. Uh, I want Dude, people I, are on the edge of this. their seats. They want pillar number three. That's the next one. <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm looking at my text messages. Like you and I were literally text messaging a founder. Well, one of the founders that you and I know just sent us a text message, a screenshot of a LinkedIn announcement, somebody else that just came on our team. And um, he says, uh, this founder says, what a move. She already had so many broker relationships, blankety blank smart. And he's, you know, so this is what I'm talking about. Like, like we, we are getting the best people. What's fun too is like these people want to, they're coming to us now because they, are seeing uh-huh. what we're doing and they want to be a part of it. Here's another, here's somebody I got, I got a text message just from one of, uh, I was talking to our CMO and she's like, she's like, Hey, uh, your second in command at, you know, one of your brands is so good at Instagram. And so, um, we were just, I was messaging back and forth with that particular founder. And then we sent her, um, a fractional C O O to uh to see if that's a good fit you and i yeah. both not she's going to be a great fit because we spent time with her and you've known her for a long time she's built a brand yeah. i mean like we thought she was a perfect fit but um but we sent her to the founder and i was talking to to the founder about it and then uh she sent me a mesh like i could um she's like uh i could hear that she has the same vision in our industry and sees a gaping hole an opportunity for our brand to capture an entire single service and dominate. And she just went on and on and on. But so what's like, all about, I'm just man. reading an actual text message that that I that I got. And she just she just was so excited um I love uh, that. to have her. But that's that's finding and curating the right person for the right brand in the right position. Yep. That's what it's all about, man. That's the magic. So what are we doing in Denver? You want to talk about Denver? No, we're not going to talk about Denver. No, we're not talking about Denver. That's next one. That's with (laughs) pillar number three. (laughs) That's with pillar number three. Let's do a Denver recap next week and get into (laughs) pillar number three because that's what what they want to know. What what are you going to do in Denver? And what is pillar number three? And that's next week. That's next week. (laughs) We'll record that. We'll record that when we're back, uh, back from our three day trip to Denver. <laughs> All right, man. Awesome call, man. This was we'll, great. We'll wrap it. Thanks for listening to the Franchise Secrets podcast. Links to everything can be found over at FranchiseSecrets.com. And if you want my help with anything from starting your own franchise to growing your current franchise business, please visit ScalableFranchise.com.